A wasp stings a cockroach in the brain, rendering it a mindless zombie that she can lead to her home and fill with eggs that will hatch and devour the insect from the inside. A snail accidentally eats the eggs of a flatworm, and the eggs hatch, filling the snail's eye stalks with sacks of wriggling larvae. They mimic the movements of caterpillars, attracting hapless birds and enticing them to swoop down, attack, eat, and continue the life cycle of the worms. The spores of the cordyceps fungus make their way inside of a doomed ant, taking over its nervous system, puppeteering its body, and forcing it to march to the nearest highest point, only to die and split open, fungus blooming from its corpse and spreading spores to the next victim. Underwater, the sea louse settles into its new home inside of a fish's mouth, feeding on blood from the tongue until it withers away. There, the louse attaches itself in the tongue's place, serving as a mimic of the original organ, while the fish is none the wiser. Back on land, humans are not exempt. Nematode worm larvae infect the bloodstream through fly bites, hiding undetected until their host feels them wriggling beneath the cornea. Guinea worms enter the system when a person drinks infested water, growing longer and longer, then forcing their way out through the foot. Nature is full of terrifying parasitic creatures, but far scarier than the parasites we know about are the parasites that we haven't discovered yet. The creatures sneaking in and burrowing under the skin of their hosts without anyone even knowing they exist. After all, if you don't know something is there, how can you possibly hope to protect yourself from it? As a man hikes through the woods of the Pacific Northwest, he's thinking about repelling mosquitoes and pulling up his socks to stop ticks from latching onto his flesh, but he has no idea what else is lurking out here in the wild with him. He knows to look out for mountain lions and bears, to watch for signs of rabid animals, and avoid being bitten or scratched. But he doesn't notice the tiny, almost invisible flecks drifting through the air around him. He doesn't notice when one happens to get caught on the breeze of his inhale, pulled into his nostril. He rubs at his nose idly, sniffing to clear his airways, then turns his attention to a bird nesting in a nearby tree. All the while, something is taking root right under his nose. Well, actually, inside of it. But he doesn't feel a thing other than the occasional urge to sneeze. He does, sneezing loud enough to startle the bird he was observing moments ago, but it doesn't do any good. Sneezes are for clearing out dust and debris, foreign objects that wind up in the nose by happenstance. This new intruder is there by design, and it is holding on tight. The hiker continues the rest of his walk without a care in the world, taking deep breaths of fresh forest air and relishing the feeling of the breeze on his face. By the time he gets back home, he's made it out of the woods without a single mosquito bite, with nary a tick to be found in his meticulous pre-shower check. That night, he sleeps soundly, and the next morning as he goes back to work at his office job, all thoughts of the wilderness slowly drift from his mind. He goes about his ordinary routine for months, all the while carrying a hidden passenger with him from place to place, a tiny little thing steadily growing larger and larger, spreading spindly appendages out and up through the nasal passages up toward the skull. One night, about six months after that fateful hike, the man is sleeping peacefully in his bed, dreaming of a sunlit forest clearing and the pleasant chirping of birds, when all of a sudden, he's jerked awake by a splitting pain in his head. His vision swims from the throbbing pain, and he clutches his face, pressing against his forehead. It must be a migraine, he thinks. He hasn't had one in quite some time, but this is clearly no ordinary headache. Eventually, the pain subsides, and he's able to drift back to sleep. But the next day, at the office, it returns, that same sharp pain radiating through his skull, like the worst sinus headache he has ever had. The persistent feeling of pain and pressure in his head becomes too much to bear, and he decides to take the rest of the day off of work and go to the doctor. Much to the man's relief, his doctor is not concerned. With no other troubling symptoms presenting themselves, the situation seems relatively straightforward. She writes a prescription for some migraine medication, then sends the man on his way. That night, when the headache returns, the man takes some of the medicine, and the cloud of pain clears. Sweet relief. Once again, things are good. For a couple months, at least. But then, one day, on his morning walk to the office, just as he's lifting his travel mug of coffee to his lips, his vision cuts out. It's as if something is blocking his eyes, as if someone were covering them and preventing him from seeing directly ahead. But when he lifts his hand to feel his face, there's nothing there. Panicking at the sudden loss of sight, he drops his cup, spilling coffee all over the sidewalk. 
He doesn't even notice the spill, too busy grasping at his face and feeling his eyes with his fingers. He fumbles in his pocket for his phone, hoping he can remember where the numbers on the screen are well enough to call 911. But his hands are shaking so hard that he drops the phone, hearing it clatter on the pavement. He exclaims in frustration and fear and turns around following the sound of the phone. And as he turns, his vision suddenly clears, the blinders lifted, and he's able to see just as well as he did before. Experimentally, he turns back to face his original direction, and again, he loses his sight, something blocking his view. He turns around, and he can see again. He tries this a few more times, spinning back and forth, back and forth, watching his vision flicker in and out. He only stops when a passing jogger shouts at him, asking what the hell he's doing. The interruption startles him, bringing him back to earth. What is happening? Surely this can't be normal. What is it about facing one direction that causes him to lose his sight, while another direction returns him to normal? A sinking feeling in his stomach tells him that, whatever was causing his headaches before, it was not something he should ignore any longer. He grabs his phone off the ground, calls out of work, and schedules an urgent appointment with his doctor. At first, he considers running home and getting his car or his bicycle, but his unreliable vision would make taking either mode of transportation a potentially deadly mistake. So instead, he walks. The walk to the doctor's office is the most difficult walk of the man's life. Every time he turns a corner, he wonders if his vision will flicker out again, if the mysterious obstacle will block his sight and force him to reroute himself or start from scratch. While trying to maintain a consistent line of sight, he loses his balance several times and nearly collides with the lamppost. Eventually, he reaches the doctor's office. One look at the man's terrified face is enough for the doctor to insist on some immediate x-rays of his head. The man sits on the examination table, nervously bouncing his knee, waiting for the doctor to return with the results. What could it be? Some undiagnosed degenerative illness? A tumor? Irreparable damage caused by looking at a solar eclipse as a child? The man can hear the doctor speaking to a nurse in hushed, frightened tones just outside of the exam room door. He can't quite tell what she is saying, but he makes out one word that makes his blood run cold. Infestation. When the door opens and the doctor enters holding the man's chart, her expression is neutral and professional, but her face is pale, her forehead dotted with sweat. She can't hide the fact that whatever she saw on that x-ray, it horrified her. What is it? He asks, though he isn't sure he wants to hear the answer. The doctor is silent for a moment, turning over the right words to say in her mind. After a seemingly endless pause, she pulls an x-ray from the stack of papers on her clipboard and pins it up for them both to see. There the man can see his skull, a white outline against the dark background, his skeleton on display. But inside of the skull, there's a mass that definitely shouldn't be there. It starts in his nose, a rounded shape but it stretches out in long limbs that travel up into his brain. After a long pause, the doctor speaks. I've never seen anything quite like this before. At first, I thought it might be some sort of growth, but as I reviewed the scans, I realized that it showed signs of movement. Whatever is in there, I'm afraid that it's alive. The man's stomach turns, and he worries for a moment that he might be sick all over the clean white floor. Instead, he just asks the doctor what can be done to help him. She explains that she plans to give him a local anesthetic, then attempt to get a closer look at the situation. Once she has eyes on the parasite, she will see if she can surgically remove it without causing any additional damage to his brain tissue. All the man can think about is that thing inside of his skull and how badly he wants it gone by any means necessary. He immediately agrees, and after a few quick injections, he's lying on his back, staring up at the ceiling as the doctor performs a nasal endoscopy. She slides the tube up his nostril a little bit at a time, monitoring the image on a nearby screen. Suddenly, she freezes, a small gasp escaping her lips. He demands to know what she's seeing, and she stammers, saying only that it's a creature she's never seen before, but it looks quite a bit like a sea spider. The man's eyes widen, and he's about to say something else, when suddenly his vision goes dark again. Now he knows what that means, and the doctor's startled cry confirms it. The creature is moving. The man begins shaking, begging the doctor to get it out of him, to just grab the invader with some tweezers or whatever it is doctors do in this situation and get it out of his head. She grabs a pair of nasal forceps and slowly eases them into his nose, but the creature feels her coming and lurches upward away from her grasp. The man feels a sudden burst of pain, 
and then everything goes dark as he loses consciousness, his eyes fluttering shut. The doctor checks his pulse, checks his breathing, and attempts to rouse her patient, but he's out cold. As she examines him, she notices a fluttering motion beneath his right eyelid. At first, she thinks she imagines it and takes a closer look. The flutter turns into a distinct, undeniable bulge beneath the eyelid, and then a slender limb pokes out from beneath the thin veil of flesh. It curves under the eyelid, tugging it open to reveal the unfocused eyeball beneath and something else. Something moving, pushing the eyeball aside just slightly without knocking it from the socket. The doctor watches in open-mouthed horror as more long, thin appendages join the first, poking out from behind the eye toward the air. The many-legged creature pulls itself from the ocular cavity and begins scuttling down her patient's face over his neck and off the edge of the exam table and onto the floor. As it nears the door, the doctor regains her ability to move and rushes to try and catch the thing. She grabs a jar and the forceps, hoping to capture it without touching it. Even with gloves on, she shudders at the thought of touching the thing. It evades her grasp, darting away from her forceps. It scrabbles back toward the table, and in a moment of primal instinct and revulsion, the doctor brings her foot up and stomps on the little parasite with all of her strength. When she lifts her shoe, all that's left on the ground is a few spindly legs and a small brown stain. She curses herself for acting impulsively and not finding a way to trap the thing and keep it for observation, but that ship has sailed. The only thing she can do now is tend to her patient and monitor his well-being. As she approaches the man on the table, his eyes open, and he gasps, sitting up suddenly and gripping his head. The man awakes with a headache and a foggy feeling in his head, but also with a sense of relief, a feeling that the unwelcome presence that took up residence in his skull for so many months is thankfully gone. He asks the doctor, haltingly, struggling to find his words, if she was able to remove the creature. She tells him, simply, that it is gone now. The man slowly climbs off of the table, and ignoring the protests from the doctor as she begs him to sit back down and let her examine him, he walks out of the office and heads back home. Over the next several weeks, the man returns to normal life. He feels a little bit different, a little hazier, a little slower to respond. He tires more easily, going to bed earlier and sleeping in later, but overall, he feels nothing but relief. Still, that night, when he tries to fall asleep, he thinks of those x-rays. He imagines what that creature might have looked like when the doctor got it out, how it might have moved. He wonders where it came from, or if it will come back. He never goes hiking in those particular woods again. Meanwhile, the doctor receives an influx of patients complaining of persistent headaches. Sometimes it's a sinus infection, sometimes it's a hormone imbalance, sometimes it's stress. But a few times, well, she knows what to look for now. She tells her patients to watch out for changes in vision, for a feeling of pressure in their skull. She learns how to keep a straight face when looking at their x-rays and seeing that familiar long-limbed shape burrow deep in their nasal cavities. She puts her patients under now when she tries to remove the creatures. It doesn't make much of a difference, but it saves them the terror of the truth, saves them the feeling of the creature thrashing inside their head until it knocks them out. She manages to collect a few specimens for study and contacts her friend at the Centers for Disease Control. He's never seen or heard of anything like these parasites either, but he does know someone who might be able to offer their expertise. When the doctor comes into work the next day, there are two strangers waiting in her office. They introduce themselves as employees of a specialized research foundation and ask to see her samples. The next thing she knows, the doctor is waking up in bed the following morning, and she has no memory of ever seeing a patient with a strange spidery parasite in their skull. If she remembered enough to look for the records, she would find that they had disappeared from her office along with the living specimens she had collected. But she doesn't remember, and her discovery is now in the hands of the SCP Foundation, who have given it an official designation, SCP-1104. SCP-1104, commonly nicknamed nose crabs, is a species of organism tentatively identified as a member of the order Chelicerata, which includes sea spiders and horseshoe crabs. The life cycle of the organism consists of at least two phases. The first of these is a larval stage, at which point the creature is approximately 0.4 millimeters in diameter. At irregular intervals, SCP-1104 larvae are expelled from tubes at a concentration of up to 200 per cubic meter. These larvae drift through the air for as long as 14 hours at a time, 
and have been spotted traveling for several kilometers under the right weather conditions. Whenever an SCP-1104 larva is inhaled, it will attach to the nasal mucosa of its host and begin to excrete H1 receptor antagonists that suppress inflammation as well as the implantation of any further larvae. Over the next six to eight months, SCP-1104 will grow larger, extending appendages through the ethmoidal canals of the host. Aside from occasional persistent headaches, the host will likely not notice the presence of SCP-1104 during this period. Once the organism has matured, however, it will begin to apply pressure to its host's optic nerves, causing its central visual field to be obstructed. SCP-1104 will apply this pressure selectively whenever the host is not oriented toward the gradient of atmospheric hydrogen sulfide. SCP-1104 can detect this hydrogen sulfide through its host's nasal respiration. At first, this effect is distressing to the host, but after a little while, they will begin to adjust their behavior accordingly, showing a preference for facing and moving in directions that do not cause those visual disturbances. Without realizing it, the host is moving closer and closer to higher concentrations of hydrogen sulfide. Once the host reaches an area with sufficient hydrogen sulfide concentration, SCP-1104 will extend its appendages into the host's prefrontal cortex, causing the host to lose consciousness. While the host is passed out, SCP-1104 will exit through their ocular cavity. Once SCP-1104 has left its host, it will attempt to find and enter the source of the hydrogen sulfide. This can include, but is not limited to, a lava tube or a sewer pipe. Whatever it does next is currently unknown, as its subterranean behavior and development has not been documented. Humans show the same instinctive aversion to SCP-1104's visual disturbances as other animal hosts, but they are also able to defy this influence. They are especially able to avoid following SCP-1104's prompting if they are informed of the nature of the infestation. Any attempt to surgically remove or poison a fully developed SCP-1104 will trigger its exit response, and it will flee through the host's ocular cavity and scuttle away. Following SCP-1104's exit, the former host displays a lack of spontaneous response to external stimulus, with delayed reactions as well as changes to personality linked to orbital frontal lesions. While individual instances of SCP-1104 are relatively easy to destroy, the species as a whole is considered endemic to certain subsurface geological formations. As it currently stands, the general population of SCP-1104 cannot be reached by convenient means of extermination. An area 10 meters in diameter, thought to contain the majority of SCP-1104, has been blocked off from the public under the guise of conservation and designated Site-104. Any non-Foundation personnel mammalian organisms larger than 10 kilograms found in the area should be considered contaminated and promptly incinerated on site. Once the SCP Foundation has discovered a way to effectively exterminate SCP-1104, doing so has been strongly endorsed by the O5 Council. However, such a method has not yet been discovered. So for now, SCP-1104 continues thriving underground, spouting larvae into the air to crawl up the noses of unsuspecting deer, possums, squirrels, and humans. So if you go out walking and feel a little tickle in your nose, it might just be a bit of extra pollen in the air. Or it might be a tiny nose crab, burrowing itself into your mucosal tissue, growing just a little bigger every day until it reaches your brain. But like I said, maybe it's nothing. No need to get crabby about it. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like Botfly Parasite, SCP-658, 